So hello everybody, welcome back to the Marketing Freaks podcast. Today we're going to be talking about growth marketing, but particularly a story about a business in the US called Morning Brew. And to take us through that, we have the Director of Growth, Jenny Rothenberg. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Happy Friday. Um, although this is recorded on Friday, normally goes out on a Tuesday, but we'll say happy Friday anyway. <laughs> right, right. Um, so super interesting story with Morning Brew, uh, phenomenally successful newsletter business, um, 2.5 million subscribers. Yes, yes. When we last spoke, and I'm sure that's probably grown <laughs> a little bit since then as well. Hope so, yeah. <laughs> So like clearly kind of in your position as director of growth and director of marketing, A, like what an experience to be part of such an amazing journey and B, you must be doing a pretty decent job. <laughs> I like to think so, but always, always room for improvement. So I guess like for people who don't know about Morning Brew, do you want to give a little bit of a overview as to what the business is, what you do, kind of a little bit of the background and story? Sure. Yeah. So uh, Morning Brew started uh, back in 2015 as a single newsletter uh, covering the must-read business news of the day. Uh, we focused really just on that single product for a few years, growing and scaling that newsletter. And in the past couple of years, we have launched a podcast and three additional newsletters focusing um, on specific industries. So we have Retail Brew, Marketing Brew, and Emerging Tech Brew, um, as well as a lifestyle newsletter called The Essentials. Excellent. And the podcast is the Business Casual Podcast. Excellent. They all follow a similar theme, similar kind of style, um, which I think kind of I've been subscribed for a while now and it's all just written so well and curated so well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, our content team is incredible. We really try to, you know, bring life and energy into our content, you know, started on the fact that a lot of business news is pretty dry and boring and not terribly interesting, especially to the younger generations. Um, so really try to, um, you know, bring tone and personality um, while still making it informative and factual. Yeah, and it's quite an interesting mix of stories in each newsletter. So you've got kind of the big business headlines, there's a bit about the stock markets, there's some fun stuff. Um, how does that all get like, what's the process behind curating that? Like, what goes into, because it's easy to kind of read the email, but like, what's the process behind like curating those stories? Yeah, for sure. So our, our content team could probably give you a better answer, but um, <laughs> they definitely, you know, they are, you know, in the weeds on news all day, every day. Um, and keep in mind what is kind of the stories that are catching their eye every day and are just communicating throughout the day. I think this should be top story. I think this should definitely be somewhere in there, but maybe it's not you know, the number one story and just kind of trying to make sure that there's a balance of interesting stories, but also the most important ones and making sure that, you know, we're, we're delivering on that, that promise of you will know the most important business news of the day, but also able to kind of sprinkle in ones that are a bit more fun or more interesting. Yeah, no, it definitely works because it, it just reads so well. Um, I think the other really interesting story or like part of the story around growth is your referral program which when I received it, it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is a really interesting take on it. And again, just really simple. And it's, you've got tiers, haven't you? So, you know, you refer like one or two people and you get a small gift, you refer 10 people, you might get a t-shirt and then 20 people and it just goes up and up, doesn't it? So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because to me, that was a really interesting kind of pleasant surprise as a subscriber to get that mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Our uh, product lead, Tyler Dank, built the whole thing um, custom himself. It, it is awesome. It is, you know, the engine behind all of our growth, really, you know, the flywheel that, that kicks everything into second gear. Um, the, you know, the gist there is, you know, incentivize readers to share the brew with their friends by giving them rewards and prizes. So for each milestone from three, five, 10, 15, and so on, there's a different reward associated with that. And we try to make it as easy as possible for readers to share and keep track of how many referrals they have, how close they are to kind of their next incentive, make it super easy for them to, to send a text or post on Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is um, with their link so that they can, you know, start racking up referrals, keep tracking of, of them on their personalized hub and keep, you know, pushing toward 
toward getting more referrals. Yeah, it's great. Although having said that, I keep recommending people and forgetting my link. So. Oh yeah, yeah, we get that a lot. People being like, "I had I had so many people sign up, but I forgot to use my personal link." And we're yeah. Like, I'm probably due a t-shirt at least, but um, there yeah. we go. I mean, like that's just saying, like, I guess that's testament to quite how good it is that just word of mouth must be a massive driver with or without those incentives. Yeah, definitely. We, we find that that is, you know, our number one driver. And what's also great about the referral program is we are incentivizing people with Morning Brew branded gear. Like we're not paying them. We're not giving them, you know, like an iPod or why would I say an iPod? Um, who, who wants that anymore? But um, we're not giving people. <laughs> Other tablets things. are available. Yeah, we're not. Um, you know, we're giving them Morning Brew branded, you know, T-shirt, hat, whatever it is, and that just you know, in, you know, deepens their relationship with the brand. They're now walking around with that. Um, they're drinking out of a Morning Brew mug, which is you know our logo. So it just really kind of strengthens the brand in in that way, um, as well as driving you know pure, pure growth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so why do you think Morning Brew has been so successful? Like, what do you think is behind the growth? Because before we start recording, you were saying that you joined the business when it was around about the 400,000 subscriber mark, which is still pretty decent. Um, so to go from that 400,000 to 2.5 million in the time that you've been there, like what what is it that makes Morning Brew so, so so successful compared to other newsletters? Do you think? I would say just as a business, we have been able to maintain a sort of laser focus. You know, we were a single product company for a, a very long time, um, perhaps a longer time than people advised us to be, um, and that allowed us to really just focus on the three elements of of running the what was once just a single newsletter business, which was write a really good newsletter grow that newsletter and sell ads in that newsletter. And it's just those, you know, it was just those three pillars of the company and being solely focused on that for a solid two, you know, three years, I think really allowed us to perfect it. And now that we're at a point where they're all kind of efficient engines behind writing, growing and selling, they will always be the most important things. We are now finally able to make sure that we don't lose that. Yeah. That is still like the, the, core of the business, but we are able to folk, you know, try other things, move, you know, expand the company, expand our offerings while still not losing that focus on the morning Brew newsletter needs to be as, the best product as, as possible. It needs to keep growing and we need to keep selling ads in it. Yeah. So kind of that focus in the beginning has allowed us to, to really perfect it and now continue to move on to other elements of the business. So it's been really like honing in on the the core product and making sure that is absolutely as good as it can be and best in class. And that's really been the fundamental, right? Yeah, exactly. I think it could have been tempting to try a bunch of other things, especially where the media industry was when when we started. We could have, you know, tried to get a ton of page views or pivot to video or do something, you know, all of these other things. But we just decided to focus on newsletters and we felt like we had so much more room to run in in growing and perfecting that newsletter um, yeah. that we decided not to do that. And I think it was the decision not to do something was actually the best decision we could have made at that point. Yeah, definitely. I'd love that point on focus. And even though you're, you now have some kind of other newsletters, you've got the podcast, it's still pretty focused. Like you haven't created a big publishing site you haven't like it's still really focused my view anyway coming yeah. from looking at it from the outside is that it's still got that focus yeah um there's definitely a lot going on um behind the scenes and hopefully new products launching in 2021 that should hopefully continue to expand what we're doing um yeah. whether it's you know between things like updating our website launching new audio products more multimedia social first content everything like that to you know, just be able to reach our readers um, in different places. Like we don't want to just continue launching newsletter after newsletter after newsletter. We don't really see that as a great long term strategy, even though it's it's easy to kind of rest on what you're good at. Yeah. Um, we want to make sure that we are expanding into other opportunities, both for our readers and our advertisers. That you know, that is something that we feel like both sides are craving um, is is some different types of content, and we also feel like 
the business news that we cover in the newsletter, like the newsletter is the best vehicle to deliver that. Whereas other topic areas that we want to go into, a newsletter isn't necessarily the best means to communicate that content. So we want to make sure that, you know, we are, we're experimenting elsewhere and, and pushing our content out in other places. That makes total sense. And do you think part of the success is driven by a change in how people want to consume news and want to consume content and that like short, snappy, social first seems to win? Like, do you think it's obviously like the product's amazing, but mm-hmm. do you think there's a wider shift towards super digestible content and super digestible news? I would say we try to provide that like in the newsletter. And I, w- I think that for us, there, there are definitely a, a, a lot of publishers doing well with news social first content. I don't necessarily see us going down that path when it comes to like social and other platforms. I think okay. we, will, we will, you know, we see ourselves as more of like a content company than a news company. News is one form of content we deliver. Um, so business casual, even they're not covering news, right? Kinsey's not breaking news on business casual or recapping that week's news. She's kind of diving deep into business topics with experts. And it's very, you know, you're supposed to walk away from that feeling smarter. And like you learned a ton about a different subject matter that you couldn't have learned in like a short, quick newsletter headline. Um, So we're trying to make sure that with whatever value we're trying to deliver the reader, we're doing it in the the medium that makes sense to deliver on that. So whether so for business casual going a 30, 40 minute podcast, that's a better place to go super deep on a topic that isn't necessarily newsy. Um, we don't really think that is the best way to deliver quick headlines, right? Like it, it just doesn't match. Sure. Um, so I think as we think about each kind of type of content we want to deliver to the reader, it's, it's just kind of finding that match. Yeah. And like the podcast in itself is brilliant. I mean, you get some amazing guests on there. Like, yeah, what, our podcast team is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are the what are, what do you think the highlights are? Because, you yeah, you get some super big guests on there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been very exciting. You know, from Mark Cuban, Meg Whitman. I'm not going to do this justice, but uh, yeah, it, we've had pretty much um, a ton of amazing guests on the podcast, and I think Kenzie does an amazing job being able to ask not necessarily the same questions that they get asked on every other interview. Um, That's something she really focuses on is making sure that she's asking unique questions and giving our listeners a different perspective than if that, if that same, you know, super big business person is also going around doing a ton of interviews um, on other podcasts as well. It's on business casual, you're going to get a different perspective and Kinsey's going to bring that, bring that out of them. Yeah, I think that almost follows the flavor of Morning Brew in general. Like it's mm-hmm. it's a it's a different view and a different take delivered in a slightly different way, almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think as we continue to expand our, our brands and our franchises, we will always kind of have that that you know edge to us. And I think with with each type of product that we're delivering, it will kind of show itself in a different way. But it will it will hopefully all stay stay true to kind of the core morning brew brand. Yeah, definitely. And how does the podcast fit into the marketing mix? Like, because uh, I subscribed to the newsletter and then found the podcast. Mm-hmm. I didn't find the podcast and then go, oh, morning brew is great. I'm going to go and subscribe to the newsletter. Do you find that it, that's the way it tends to work, or does it also is it also a good driver of new um, acquisition? for the newsletter? Yeah, so I would say it definitely, um, it works both ways. Obviously, Morning Brew is driving more to business casual at this moment, um, just due to its size and age. But I think the longer term strategy for us is that every new franchise that we are popping up is developing on its own. It's reaching new people and we're just elevating all of the franchises as opposed to just using Morning Brew as a launch pad into everything else. That's not really a super sustainable strategy. And yep. we also, we just want to be able to, we want to be okay with the fact if you just listen to business casual, that's okay. If you don't, if we don't have to necessarily force you to morning brew, uh, you know, being, being okay with the fact that we need to de- develop all of these franchises to be able to live on their own. And yes, we want to move those eyeballs around and, and make sure that we're exposing people to other types of content they might be interested in. But the goal is for them all to really be, you know, sustaining, growing, 
audiences and and franchises. Yeah, that that makes complete sense. And I think it again, it shows in the content because it's when you when you do it like that, it's it just comes over so much more naturally, I think. Um, so marketing and growth, what does the marketing mix look like for you? How has that changed across your time in the business? What have you seen kind of drive the most growth in terms of marketing strategies or tactics? Sure. So the referral program, obviously, as we talked about, is a giant um, yeah. growth driver for us and always optimizing and perfecting that and trying to add new elements to it, run tests, whatever it is, um, since it is such a great driver um, that will always you know, be a, a source, um, an area that we're focused on. Um, outside of that, especially in the beginning, we were running a lot of Facebook ads. I'm sure it was very popular, especially back in 2018. Yeah. <clears throat> that um, was a huge portion of our growth, especially in the early days. It has, it, pro it probably was closer to like 60 to 70% of our budget. It's now down to probably 10. That's um, a big shift. Yeah, we've, we've been able to, you know, we started to see CPMs rising and made a really strong push to focus on developing other channels, knowing that nothing's going to be as scalable and simple as Facebook ads. They're very good at making you want to keep spending your money there. Oh, yeah. But, uh, knowing that we didn't want to be fighting this fight against Facebook CPMs rising and making sure that we were um, in other places as well. And so we definitely now have a much more diverse group of you know channels working for us. And in that process, we've actually been able to find a lot more other efficient channels. Um, one of them being we sponsor a lot of other newsletters. That was, you know, one of our early um, early channels as well. And we have also found success with affiliate programs and kind of CPL relationships with other publishers that are, you know, reach kind of a similar demographic to Morning Brew. Yep. Do you think that's because the environment environment matches so well? So if you're sponsoring another newsletter you're hitting people who like newsletters yeah definitely that is something we always say is with if we can have, ever get an advertisement in an email whatever kind that is uh it that is usually going to perform well because step one of being a good morning group subscriber is that you open emails it's hard to be a good morning group subscriber if you don't do that so that that has been really big for us so we run a lot of cross promotions and swaps um with other with other newsletters or even just brands that have uh, email lists. And we've also seen some success with programmatic in email to, okay. to varying degrees. Um, but yep. that's been the only type of programmatic at all that has really worked for us. So is the majority of your sponsorship or kind of placing ads in other newsletters, is it kind of you're doing it manually, like as in it's a manual process to find the relationships, build the relationships? place the ads you know rather than relying on networks or other solutions are you going out there and going right that we know that that newsletter matches what we're mm -hmm. doing perfectly that's going to be a great fit let's do it yeah exactly it is a lot of direct relationships and we are running pretty much exclusively native ads as opposed to display ads within email that you know is really our, our bread and butter of what works what is the challenge with that is it's not sca that scalable, right? You have to have sure. all of those relationships, which yeah. has taken a long time to build, but because they are so efficient and they really bring in that high quality user as opposed to just the cheap user who doesn't open, um, it is it is proven to always be worth it to establish that relationship with the great publisher. Be like, okay, we're going to buy once a month for a year or something like that, just to make sure that uh, we are maintaining that and are making sure that even though it's a smaller scale, we can just set it and kind of forget it and yep. make sure that we can move on to something else. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Back to the comment of Facebook ads. <clears throat> um, at the time, like, what sort of ads were you using? Um, I'd love to get your take on the lead ad format because on the surface, mm -hmm. it looks, oh, great, cool. That's a really good looking, easy format to build a build a database. What did you find and what were you running and what was driving that success from from your spend at the time? Yeah, definitely. So we we definitely tested into the lead ad format. Like you said, it seems super frictionless. It seems like a no-brainer if you're trying to grow an email list. Yep. But what we found was on the back end looking at 
the users who we were getting from that. They weren't really opening the newsletter frequently, if not at all. Uh, so we shifted totally toward landing page, driving people to our landing page and signing up. We typically now just don't even bother with lead ads uh, on any platform just because we've seen it fail so many times. Yeah. Um, and since that engagement is just so important to us and we are measuring that so obsessively, we are measuring everything towards that as opposed to just, you know, the cost for acquisition. So yeah. that is, you know, we usually just stick to, we want to drive people to our landing page, make sure they know they're signing up, they're inputting their email themselves. It's not just like a one click situation. Yeah. That's really interesting because it is, like you say, like that ad format is such a frictionless one. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, well, on one side, that's the benefit of it. But on the other side, that's the risk of it. Because when something's so easy and takes so little thought for someone to complete, how qualified are they going to be at that point? And how do you measure that? Because it's one thing to measure, you know, cost per subscriber or subscriber volume. How do you make sure that you're tying back your marketing or advertising or sponsorship activity to a, a quality subscriber? How do, you, how do you know that that's the case? Yeah, so we define a high quality subscriber as one that opens six or more times in their first 12 days of being a subscriber. So for example, if a source is bringing in subscribers at $5 per subscriber, and 50% of those users are high quality, then their high quality acquisition cost is $10. And so we're measuring everything on that high quality acquisition cost as opposed to just the pure CAC. And that you know keeps us focused on making sure that we're bringing in users who are actually opening. We're not just you know scooping up the cheap subscribers either through lead ads or co-reg or something like that. We are always willing to pay you know, a bit more to make sure that that user is quality even if you know that front end cost is is a bit scarier it it does always just kind of pan out in the long term even though those 12 days like that's obviously a very short amount of time in the lifespan of a morning brew subscriber hopefully yep um but we have found that that is pretty indicative of someone's lifetime if they do open six or more times in those first 12 and i'm guessing that's been tested quite extensively to get to that number of 6 over the years yes definitely and and thankfully it is it is actually held pretty held true over the, over the years, which is good to see. And obviously there are other things the subscriber can do besides opening that contribute to their, how valuable they are to the business, whether it's clicking on ads or referring, referring their friends, obviously that, you know, cuts their acquisition costs down if they refer 10 people. So that's something we kind of take into account as well, but for simplicity and making sure that we, it's something we can measure quickly and either know that we need to scale the source or shut it down and be able to, you know, adapt quickly. We just, we focus on that and we still look at everything else on the more long-term basis, but, but on the kind of weekly, what are we monitoring? What are we checking on? It's, it's that six out of 12. That's amazing. And how do other social channels fit into the mix? Cause I know you guys are really active on Twitter, both from kind of a business, but also like all the individuals, team mm -hmm. members, are super active on Twitter. Um, what about channels like LinkedIn? Because on the surface, LinkedIn feels like a good fit and that it's a you know more of a B2B, a business platform. Like how much experimentation do you do? Like what platforms or social networks are part of the mix? Yeah, definitely. We we definitely should be doing more on on everything across social media. Um as far as LinkedIn. We, we take it right now, it's more of a, a personality approach. So Alex Lieberman, our CEO, is is a linked influencer. Um, he has a, a ton of followers, yeah. gets a ton of engagement on his posts. And so we he hosts every week a, a CMO series where he inter talks to a CMO, asks them you know, questions about their approach to marketing at their company and hosts that live on LinkedIn. So that's kind of always, always in the feed. You can always find Alex if you follow him in your newsfeed. Um, but beyond that, on LinkedIn for for Morning Brew, like the company, we we definitely have you know experimentation to do, and it is something we want to focus on in the future. And then um, I would say on Twitter, our Twitter has definitely um, exploded in the past few months. Toby Howell, our our writer, just started you know going crazy on it, and he's crushing <laughs> it. Um, but yeah, I think we kind of are in the process of really developing what each of our social channels' purpose is for us, and making sure that we're not just treating them all the same 
but making sure that we have a distinct strategy for each and not just for morning brew, but for something, for example, business casual, the podcast, you know, we see Twitter and Instagram as a great way to build people's exposure to, to business casual, you know, Kinsey's posting videos there, yeah. you know, all the time talking about what's going on this week in business casual, posting clips of her interviews, which I'm sure is what you'll probably do for the show as well. Um, but yeah, just using to using, um, social to build that kind of awareness. We're not, you know, asking yeah. people to subscribe on social media. We're just using it as a means of driving more communication engagement with our readers, hopefully building more awareness of the brand and just, you know, making sure that we're, we're doing, you were treating each platform the way it is meant to be. Yeah, definitely. Do you think, again, it comes back to that focus point and that I always feel like it's better to absolutely nail one platform than it is to just be a bit average at all of them and try too much. Yeah, definitely. I would say right now we are, I, I, I don't, we definitely probably have room to still improve, but I would say we are pretty much doing really well on Twitter. Yeah. And we have a lot of Instagram followers that we don't necessarily activate as well as we could, but that is all just due to like bandwidth and resources issues that we are we are striving to improve on. Um, we are hiring, check out our career page. But yeah, so- we, <laughs> We'll um, stick a link in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we want to make sure that we are focusing on the ones that we feel like make sense for Morning Brew and for each individual franchise and, you know, doing them right and then making sure we're we're ready to expand to the next one as opposed to trying to do too many things at once. Excellent stuff. So kind of my last question or collection of questions mm -hmm. was around like, why do you think people, because a lot of people I think struggle with building email lists and building up databases and building momentum behind their email. Why do you think that is? I think that a lot of either brands or publishers decide to start a newsletter and use it really as just a launching pad to their website. So it's really a collection of links that they want you to click on and then go consume elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the common theme with true actual good newsletters is that the experience is meant to be consumed in the email. We're not trying to drive you somewhere else. Like obviously we are linking to other places, but you can be a great reader and never click. Um, like we're okay with that, you know? Yep. We want to make sure that we are doing our best to make that experience within the email as strong as possible. Whereas just, you know, putting together a list of links is super easy. So I think that's how a lot of people when they want to create a newsletter, that's kind of how they'll get started. And, but the challenge with that is that's not super valuable to the reader. If they know that, like, if it's just yeah. driving them somewhere else, they don't really feel that need necessarily to open. Yeah. And it's just not as engaging, but there, you know, there's obviously a, you know, a, a place for that and the purpose for that, but I wouldn't call those necessarily newsletters. Whereas I feel like that term kind of gets, gets loosely thrown around when it's really just, just a list of, of links. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, um, do you think that's one of the biggest things there is that people get so caught up in the growth bit and the driving subscribers bit that they forget that the newsletter or the email content, like they yeah. almost forget <laughs> about the content. Yeah, and definitely. Fact it has to add I, yeah. Some value. yeah, I think that it makes my job 1 million times easier that the content is good, <laughs> right? Because people stick around, people share with their friends, people... Yeah you know, it drive word of mouth growth. They want to share the content on social. You know, people do so much work for us because the content is so good. Yeah. Um, well, it just wouldn't have happened, would it, if it wasn't the quality that it is? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Reasons one through 100 why we have two and a half million subscribers is not by anything that I or anyone on my team have done. It is because the content is is so good. Uh, yeah. It's tr It wouldn't be possible without that. And the, their ability to just do it every single day is really what amazes me. Like they don't have an off day <laughs> and, um, you know, they're really delivering on that, that value prop and staying consistent and being informative and giving people that, that true like value in the news, but also making it so engaging, funny, entertaining, um, to, to really kind of get your day started. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I was going to ask what your, like one biggest piece of advice would be for someone trying to drive email growth, but you've probably already answered it in that it's focus on the value that you're adding and the content and the that 
core product, if you like, and and then worry about the growth? Yeah, I would say that's, you know, nailing the content is definitely job one. I don't think you're ever necessarily done with that part, but I feel like it needs to be at a place where you feel confident in it and that there is true value and a reason why someone should be opening it every day before you start running around asking people to subscribe. You know, like it just, you know, it is very easy to ask someone for their email. It's free. Yeah, you can get anyone to subscribe, but it doesn't really, a subscriber number really doesn't bring any value if they're not engaging with the content. And that's really just kind of what we focus on and why we why we measure ourselves on on opens instead of list size is is because if someone's not engaging, that means they just entered their email. And that's a very easy thing to do. It's a very easy thing to grab on the internet is someone's email address. But but yeah. to actually take someone's time in the morning to read a five minute newsletter, that's you know, that's much harder. It's a big deal, isn't it? I think. Yeah, it's a I, really I think big so. deal. It's, it's a lot of it's a lot of time. Uh, you know, it's an important time of people's days. And there's so many alternatives. So we take it really seriously and make sure that we're delivering on on what we set out to. Yeah, no, that, I think that's like really solid advice that is so so simple, but so many people forget that, I think. I I also just have to ask, like, what is your preferred morning brew? <laughs> do you get asked that all the time? I do, do you mean like of beverage or of, of newsletter? Beverage. Oh, um, iced coffee. Iced coffee in the morning? Yes, regardless wow. of season. Wow. So you, the deepest, darkest winter is an iced coffee. Oh, yeah, for sure. This was actually a very heated debate um, in the Morning Brew Slack channel. Um, was hot coffee versus cold coffee. We felt like we needed as a company to to reach a conclusion and we were pretty much split 50-50, so. Oh, really? Yeah, it was so, a battle. Where would I fit in on the scale? Because I'm just a black coffee, no sugar, literally pour it out the pot and that's it type of person. You, you I, are on the hot, hot coffee train for that? Yeah. yeah, hot coffee, just black, boring. Yeah, I, I definitely team black on coffee. You, you're you're in the majority on that, at least. Simple wins, I think. Yes. Simple wins. <laughs> but look, thank you so much for joining me. That was like fascinating and so many great pieces of advice and insights into Morning Brew. So thank you so much for making the time. Thanks to everyone for listening in and we shall see you next time.